Tim, he's Brian, and welcome to Watchbox. You are watching From the Vault. Now, everything you see here is for sale, but before we jump into a wrist shot from Brian, I want to remind you that the Tim Masso Zoom event is coming up next Thursday, January 14th at 6 p.m. U.S. Eastern. You'll find a link in the description below so you can register for the event. It is going to be a ton of fun. And if you're on my Facebook group, you already know Brandon Wood. He's going to be facilitating. Meet us both virtually next Thursday, 6 p.m. Sign up in the description below. Brian, what are you wearing today? So today I am wearing a 44 millimeter Octosport. This particular variation features a blue dial that was limited to eight pieces. Uh, you've got the titanium case, you've got a ceramic bezel. You do not have the rubber inserts or the rubber bumpers on the bracelet. This is the variation after that where those have been removed and replaced with a, call it platinum bumper and platinum crown. You know, what sets this watch apart at the 44 millimeter size, generally for myself, 44 millimeters is too big. But because of the lugless design, it actually fits slightly smaller than that. I'd say it probably fits more like a 42 millimeter watch than a 44. So, it, you know, for me, it's probably the largest that I could go. I've been wearing it a lot lately. You have a you know, titanium coated aluminum movement. The watch is extraordinarily light and uh, just an overall fabulous piece. Really a neat piece, and the nice thing about this, if you're familiar with the standard Jorn Octas, this piece has a fully loomed dial, so there's an extra level of utility here. And for the first time on a Jorn men's watch, we have a ceramic insert in this generation of line sport watches. There is a ceramic insert inside the bezel. The dial is a lovely lacquered gloss blue with a handsome off-white or cream-colored set of printed features, so it has that same warmth that you get from the dial of the Chronomet Bleu. A really nice piece, and again, just eight pieces. I'm going to show off the loom real quick. Here. This should activate it, I think. Hold on. Do this for a second here. No, it didn't work. Shocking. <laughs> okay, so that is the one you can't buy. Now let's take a look at some of the ones that you can. Jumping from one sports watch to the next, this is a big piece, and I'm excited to present this, but it's one of 25 gray accented dial examples of a 2018 series of 100 pieces built with four different dial accents. So 25 per each dial, and this has the anthracite gray interior details. It is the Royal Oak Tourbillon Chronograph Open Worked Black Ceramic. So 25 pieces just like this one means it is rare, and an original retail price close to $300,000 means it is spectacular. Hand skeletonized, hand finished, open wrought, I suppose it should be called, and it has a one minute tourbillon, a chronograph function, and a three day manual wine power reserve. 44 millimeters, Brian, tell me a little bit about what you love about this watch. So I love the fact that black ceramic as a whole is just scratch resistant. You know, it's probably one of the biggest drawbacks of the Royal Oak model in general, specifically the stainless steel variations, is that they're scratch magnets. You know, you scratch the brush surfaces, it's apparent. You scratch the bezels, it's apparent. The ceramic watches are extraordinarily scratch resistant. It's virtually impossible to do so. So you know that you can wear this watch on the daily without, it, without really having to worry that it's going to change the overall appearance. One of the other features that I really like about the watch is just the exceptional level of detail on the open work movement. AP is absolutely known for this movement decoration. It's something that they excel at and it's also something that you see throughout their line in, in other models. So it's, it's nice to see when you see, it's almost a rare handcraft I would say, yes, in terms of the way that they do it mixed with modern materials. So it's just a great amalgamation of techniques. You know, there's not enough uh, great things that I can say about this piece. As far as sizing goes, for me personally, uh, the 44 millimeters is a little bit large. I have a slightly smaller wrist. The 41 millimeter ceramics tend to fit me a little bit better. But overall, I mean, this watch is just absolutely awesome. Yeah, we've got that fantastic close and great cam work of the tourbillon. It's an overcoil, it's a one minute tourbillon, it's a 21.6 beat rate, and again, despite having a rather power hungry regulator, this is still a three day power reserve. The dial is also fully loomed, so between the scratch resistance, the lightness, and the loomed dial, this is an epic grail level watch that is surprisingly wearable. Now, of course, it takes three times as long to hand finish the bracelet and case of this watch, because the ceramic is treated the same way as precious metal or 
steel would be at AP. So where it takes about 11 hours to hand finish a bracelet on a steel royal oak, it takes 33 when it's done in ceramic. I'm gonna put this on my wrist. I'm also gonna acknowledge our live chat box because you guys are joining in from around the world and it's been a long time since we've been in. Cull Obsidian, Romulus 1300, Rich Buddy, Alex O. We've got Froghole 101. We've got Rich Buddy, Matt Foster, Logan Hall. We've got Robert Engel, first time catching live. We've got Abu Sadiq, hello Abu and welcome. And we've got Jack Nunez, Eddie Landsberg, longtime fan of the channel, and Dave Opencar. Happy New Year, Brian and Tim. Thank you. Happy New Happy Year, New Year to you. guys. All right. Did we mention what the, what the topic of the show is today? Yeah, well, we may as well now. The topic, because we're usually themed, is intricate dials. So the idea was how intricate could we get? And how could we do that without being super obscure? So we found some rather unusual watches mm -hmm. from mainstream brands. Yeah. And that's sort of the theme. Okay. Intricate dials, and I see right here, we've got Aaron C, Edward Ledden of Sweden, and Victor M joining in. Guys, thanks so much. We've got Simi S saying hi to Tim and Brian, and now Tim, well, let's see where Tim's gonna go from this. I think Tim's gonna go for the freak. This is Brian's <laughs> selection. I wanna talk a little bit about it. Uh, this was the first base metal freak launched in 2018. This is the freak out in titanium. And of course, this watch was the first since the 2001 original to be a base metal. Brian, tell me a little bit about what you love with this watch. So as you mentioned, in 2018, it was the first base level freak in titanium, which meaning it wasn't produced in rose gold, yellow gold, or white gold. The watch for me is much more wearable than the titanium. It's a lot lighter. What I love about this watch is that the entire movement is presented on the dial except for the barrel. And it's presented in the shape uh, and functionality of the minute hand. So it's a movement that I think put Ulysse Narden on the map in terms of high complication and just was so unique and inspiring for the rest of the line. You can view the barrel actually on the back of the watch, but uh, just the, the intricacy of the dial and how they integrated it all together, I thought was just absolutely perfect, as well as uh, how the winding mechanism is treated because there's of course no crown on this watch. Now the fun thing about this watch, and I'm gonna show you this, is that both the case back and the bezel are mobile. So let me do my best to show you how the winding works. You actually turn the case back and the reason there is a viewing port in the case back is because it allows you to more or less view the amount of energy in the mainspring. Once you're familiar with the watch and you get used to looking at the coils, you can actually tell about how much power is left in the seven day manual wind power reserve. So it has an exceptionally long power reserve. And as you can see, once you wind it enough, the carousel regulator starts ticking. The regulator is like a tourbillon in some regards, except there is a separate power source driving the rotation of the carousel and the escapement, which is why you can move the carousel using it as the minute hand without crashing the escapement. If it were just one drivetrain as with a tourbillon, uh, the combination of a single drive for the regulator as well as the carriage would cause the lever to crash. So what I can do here, and you can see this, there is a little lock at the base of the dial, and this has been true on every but the original Freak. You lift that up, and now you use the bezel to set the watch. And you can see how the whole carousel is actually moving as the minute hand, superimposed over the hour hand. The dial is fully loomed. And as you can see, it uses that rich and lustrous Ulysse Norden corporate blue. All of the sapphires, as you can see here, they're clear. So you have a lovely combination of blue and silver with clear sapphires rather than the, con than the conventional red synthetic rubies. Now it also has a free sprung regulator and a silicon escapement and a silicon hairspring. So it's highly anti-magnetic and can go well beyond five years between services, which is nice on a sophisticated watch. Again, you can move the whole thing. The carousel was invented in, I believe, 1893 by a Dane, Bonnet Bonnickson, who wanted a more rugged alternative to the tourbillon that performed fundamentally the same role of rotating the escapement through gravity. And that's exactly what the carousel does. It's just better suited, as it happens, to the construction of a wristwatch because its durability is so high. This is a lovely piece. I'm going to do a quick wrist shot. Um, first with the AP, which we had earlier, just to show you how this one fits. And it's big, but it's wearable. Also, because it's ceramic, it's That's very light. much wearable on you. Yeah, I thought this would be cartoonish, and on most 44 millimeter Royal Oaks, that would be the case, but the combination of the lightness and the flexibility of the bracelet really stood out. This is a wearable watch, and possibly even on a smaller wrist than mine. I think 15 centimeters circumference is probably the lower limit, and my wrist is 16, so that's a really good looker. Now, the Freak. 
Okay, you guys know my wrist well from our shows online. 16 centimeters, but the Freak, though, a 45. Again, it's a big watch that wears small because you can see how stubby those lugs are. On both sides, the lugs are short cropped and relatively tightly tucked, meaning the watch looks big, but it wears comfortable. And again, in a light material, in this case, media blasted titanium, it really sits snug, comfortable, and fairly light. It, it, it feels eyes closed like a 41 millimeter round watch in steel, and it's a real looker. Believe it or not, I think that the overall thickness of the watch allows it to wear a little bit higher on the wrist, which then leads the, the case itself and the bracelet to come down. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, I'd say it doesn't go over your wrist as much. I'd also say as a result of that. There's more downward flexibility Correct. to that bracelet. Normally with a Royal Oak, you know, let's say the middle, let's say my fingers are, are the actual case. You then have the bracelet on both sides and the bracelet flares out. You can't pull the bracelet straight down on most Royal Oaks. With this, you almost can. So it's not just that it's made of a different material, but the assembly of that bracelet leaves more degrees of motion than the standard Royal Oak. Because I've never offshore. been able to wear a 44 millimeter Royal Oak, and this actually surprisingly fits quite well. Yeah, I wouldn't even wear a 41 millimeter Royal Oak, to be honest, on my wrist size. Uh, this thing in a 44 is a bit of a revelation in terms of yeah. how it fits. Wow. Well, you know, for your 300 grand retail, you should get a good fit. All right, folks from Le Brasseau finally figuring out ergonomics. Now, we have a question here, how thick is the UN? I believe it's, it's roughly 14 and a half to 15 millimeters, but I do have a review of that online where I measured specifically, and I think it's gonna be right in that range. And right here we've got James T saying, surprised to find your stream this early. It's a new tradition, but one we've been practicing for a few weeks. The show is now live. Mm -hmm. Forward your questions too for me and Brian, because we like yeah. to interact with the chat box. Okay, we have a &H asking, is it smaller, does it wear smaller than a 42 millimeter offshore? I, I it's, it's interesting. Like I would almost wish I had a 42 millimeter offshore to try on in conjunction with it. I think that a mixture, as you said, of just, the way that the case positions on the wrist for the bracelet to drape down, mixed with the fact that I think black as a material just tends to look smaller in general than stainless steel does. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, to me, they're probably very comparable in terms of fit and feel. I would even go so far as to say if you're this, wearing that 42 millimeter offshore on the horn back leather strap. That'll this, fit bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's gonna be a bigger watch. The rubber I think will just fit, the rubber, the diver style. The, yeah. the diver style, based on the fact that it can fit a little bit more snug and has more bendability, may fit, you know, maybe a little bit better, but um, I, I must say that I am actually perplexed and very surprised by how well this fits. Yeah, this thing has been the surprise of the show. I think we all expected it to be like an awesome overbearing grail type thing for an overbearing grail type wrist, but I don't actually have to wear this thing around my ankle, which makes it an exception to the norm with the really big Royal Oaks. Okay, question right here from Q Maestro. I was thinking about getting a Girard Perigo Laureato. However, I have some concerns. How does the overall quality compare to the Royal Oak or the Vacheron Overseas? I'll let you take that one. Um, I mean, you know, as far as the movement's concerned, uh, GP is producing the movements in house, they always have. Uh, as far as brand recognizability goes, I mean, that's obviously one of the, I would say, biggest drawbacks of the Laureato in general, and that just the overseas and the Royal Oak have just been far more dominant over a long period of time. In terms of quality, I think the watches are made incredibly well. I mean, we've, we've talked about the Laureato in the past and how it's sort of like the black sheep of sports watches, and but it, that it deserves a lot more credibility than it gets. Um, one of, you know, they, they're also not afraid of using ceramics and other materials. I think that those are great options to look at if you're having difficulty getting, let's say, some of the royal oaks. Um, but in terms of, I'd say, versatility, uh, the overseas is probably my pick simply for the fact that you can now change between a strap, a bracelet, and a rubber strap. Um, you've got beautiful, you know, lacquer dials, um, in-house movement. So, you know, again, just. Uh, my picks. Nice piece, I really like them. Water resistance is a major advantage over, for example, the Royal Oaks, which tend to be 50 meters. The Laureatos are generally 100, so 
plus one Laureato. They're not as hand finished as the Vacheron or the AP, and that's mm -hmm. reflected in the price. Pre-owned, the things are an incredible buy because they're cheaper than the Royal Oaks and the Vacheron's new. Add the depreciation factor and you're looking at a watch that's very respectable. I consider the quality and the finish to be on par with the likes of, for example, Glasuta Original mm -hmm. or Piaget, Gégère Le uh, and, you know, frankly, if you're getting the caliber 1800 as the base or the, the driver in your Laureato, I think Technically, it's as interesting as the others. The 3000 series movements are nice dress watch calibers and they can be regulated very precise, but I think the caliber 1800s are more modern, more rugged. Uh, they will give you a longer power reserve and I would aim for that. I think a real buy, like Brian said, would be to get the ceramic model and buy it used. Mm -hmm. And that's like the best of all possible worlds because it'll never scratch, it'll never scuff, and you know if you're buying it used, it's never been refinished. And that's a bigger and bigger factor, uh, yeah. not just with vintage watches anymore, but also just general pre-owned. People don't want polish anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, for those that have watched, you know, the watches that I bring on the show, you know, I'm not one for polishing my watches. I think that they add, they well, add character. You know you don't polish your watches. We've seen <laughs> no, that. No, you know what? I mean, I think, I think a lot of it also depends on the quality of the refinish, you know, so, and if it's done to factory standards and to high levels, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. But, uh, you know, again, a watch should really only be refinished so many times in its lifetime. And uh, so it's not something that I do, but it's also not something that I'm, you know, that I'm opposed against if it's being done to a high level. And also in the pre-owned space, as warranties become longer and longer, you know, three years becomes five years, becomes in the case of Oris, 10 years, uh, there's less and less incentive among pre-owned vendors to actually decase and refinish a watch that's still under warranty. We'd rather sell it with the scratches and the full factory warranty remaining than make it look, quote, new and then void the warranty because we opened it. So that's also sort of what the thinking is in the pre-owned space. Question, Tim, what is your jacket? This is from Bellstaff. This is part of my makeover. I hope you're enjoying it. I love the combination of the pink and the green. So, Bellstaff jacket. I love the makeover. World's best zipper. This thing is unbelievable. The zipper could like couple a couple of tank tracks together. Like these zippers are what tank tracks are made of. It's that good. Uh, another question. This one's for you. What do you think about the changeover to the caliber 3861 in the Moonwatch? We talked about this before. Um, since then, it has become the default movement in the Moonwatch, mm -hmm. and the old, the old Le Mania 1873 based 1861 is retired. So, what do, you, what do we think of the changeover, the price hike, and whether the old ones will become more collectible? I mean, they've produced a lot of these watches. So, do I necessarily think the old ones are now going to become more collectible? Not so much. I agree. With um, that. I think that from an efficiency standpoint, they, they changed the movement, obviously, in order to make it more efficient. It's easier for them to produce. It's probably more cost efficient for them to produce. Um, as far as the price hike goes, I still think that the Speedmaster as a whole is great value relative to what else is out there. When you look at the price point, when you look at what comes with the watch now, when you look at the quality that Swatch Group is producing these watches to, um, your basic Rolex, honestly, is still thousands of dollars more. Yeah. So I think that overall, the price hikes, while not always desired by the consumer, are probably somewhat warranted relative to the quality of the watch that you're now getting. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan of the changes that Omega has made. You know, I, I think that they've done they've done the Speedmaster right. I would also say, again, just because they made so many before, unless you've got a watch that's like verifiably space flown or it's part of a limited edition that's highly sought or, you know, it's one of the earliest moon watch references, um, you know, with like a, a primitive case back, you know, there are several different variations of the case back. I think there are just too many of them for a generic like 2020 moon watch to suddenly become a collector's item. Fun watch, great piece, iconic, but not, a, not an investment. I would also say that the price hike for me is a little bit tough to stomach. It does seem like quite an ask for the basic moon watch to now cost in the mid 7000s on a bracelet. It is a lot less than the Rolex Daytona, that's true. Uh, it is tough to compare to the Daytona too, just because of the sizing difference and the fact that the Omega is a manual. Mm -hmm. uh, but a real investment was made in this caliber. It used to be the actual moon watch caliber uh, Speedmasters that were chronometer certified were very few and far between. And do you this think that it has that. to do though with do you think there's an element of it to trying to tie the current watch back to the original ones in order and bringing that history further across? Well, I think the fact that they changed the movement makes it 
a sort of a watershed. There's the before and after. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that continuity so much is what I'm seeing here as an attempt to you know justify a price hike because Swatch is very cost effective. Their engineering mm -hmm. is immense. Their scales of production incomprehensible. Um, so I think, relatively speaking, the profit margin probably went up on the watch relative mm -hmm. to what it cost incrementally uh, to that's, make. That's for sure. Um, so, you know, hey, you're getting a five-year warranty, which is outstanding. It's a very cool watch. It's finally anti-magnetic. It's a chronometer. There's a lot to love, and it is a big technical upgrade. Uh, I would feel a little bit cheated if I bought, like, the Apollo 11 50th anniversary piece last year, thinking that was going to be some sort of a unique movement. But for everyone else, provided the cost you know, equation makes sense. A big technical upgrade. Let's see what else people are saying right here. Tim, what's on your wrist? Still the Zin EZM, EZM11. You guys know me, but I am thinking about adding something or at least wearing one of my other watches on this show sooner rather than later. That would be nice. Yeah, that would be good. I think I'll wear uh, next time maybe one of the swatches or the Omega. And then we've got a question here from Bugsy Malone. I love the 42 millimeter Vacheron Constantin Overseas. Yellow or rose gold on rubber is probably my purchase. What do we think of those? Just like the overseas in general? What do we think of it in like yellow or rose gold on rubber? Is, is that too luxe or just luxe enough? No, I mean, I, th I, I mean, precious metal sports watches have been around for a long time. So I, I lean more towards rose than I do yellow gold. Uh, I think that some of the ultra thin pieces that they've made between the skeleton and the perpetual when they're on rubber are honestly absolutely magnificent. And uh, I think that the overseas in general and Rose are, are beautiful watches and a exceptional value relative to just availability and what you can get in terms of, you know, let's call it the, the Royal Oak and the Nautiluses are just, you know, for lack of a better word, just much more expensive. I would like to say this, that a rose gold overseas with a blue lacquer dial and a matching blue rubber strap are is gorgeous. deadly. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about one watch, go back to questions yeah. after that. Okay, so here we have a 5131J. Uh, this is a Grand Fu Closinet dial. It is, the world time complication here was actually invented by Patek Philippe. Uh, super easy to use. You've got a single push button there that's going to move you through the different time zones. What's so exceptional about this watch relative to its more basic counterpart, which is the 5130 that just features a guilloché center, is, as I said, the cloisonné center that is entirely done by hand. Tim can get into it a little more regarding the process, but just as far as this watch goes, for a long time, this was the most covetable Patek Philippe. Uh, it was an application watch, meaning that you had to apply to the brand in order to be given the opportunity to purchase it. It was here and around long before the Nautilus and Aquanaut craze took effect. And I would say that for a long time, this, like, this was the Aquanaut Nautilus. There was only one. Like, everything else was perceivably gettable except for this watch. And uh, they had been trading for the longest time in the 130 to 140 range. And as sports watches got hot, this watch slowly uh, moved down. They're now available, I would say, in the $100,000 to $110,000 range. And to me, uh, as far as the rarity goes relative to some of the other watches in the line, to me, just the value is, is, is exceptional. And I, and I do think that long term, these types of watches will 100% make a comeback. And people will say, you know, remember when those watches were trading at, you know, 100000 now, these are fantastic pieces on a couple of levels. First, if you want a, a truly Baroque movement finish, you're getting the premium of the two Patek Philippe basic automatics with the 240 micro rotor. Other things I love here, the cloisonné enamel dial. It is both enamel and cloison, which means that these little cloison or gold wires are used to create the boundaries of the continents and land masses, and then they're filled with enamel externally at a different color of enamel, but also different weight of enamel is used to create the contrast. You can see that the ocean itself features different thicknesses of enamel laid on to create the different apparent depths of the ocean. And the same is true within the land masses themselves, as different shades of green, yellow, and orange are used, achieved not just with different colors, but by varying the thickness of the enamel laid on. This is an incredibly laborious process, and it's actually completed by a mother and son team. I think it might be Susan Rohr and her son. I think Anita Porsche is technically a contractor to Patek. But it is very much artisanal, fired multiple times, built on a solid gold dial base. And the value of this watch, as much as I would like to say it's in the engineering or the movement finishing, it's really in the dial. It's the centerpiece of the watch. And really, the watch is almost like 
a gallery in which the dial can be appreciated. Now you do have the Louis Cotier and Patek Philippe invented system. Cotier invented the 360 degree encircling our reference ring and adjacent city concept in the 1930s and then later on with Patek Philippe the jumper system that allows you to step between time zones and change your reference city with the watch doing the actual math for you. You don't actually have to do anything as long as your reference time is going to be in one of the 24 principal time zones. Now you can see that 24 hour reference ring, half is blue, half is silver, that's your day-night distinction. And these are fun because over time the reference cities change as oftentimes the city names either change or the time zones of the cities change. Uh, so this timepiece, as you can see, I believe this one still features Caracas, Venezuela, which is no longer used as the reference city for that particular time zone. And of course the watch is large. At 39.5 millimeters with a crown guard structure and a broad lug-to-lug -lug span, these, uh, these 5131s really wear as much more striking wrist presence than, for example, the previous 5110s or the subsequent 5230 family. Th these are really large Calatravas. As the style goes, they have an almost sports watch-like presence on the wrist. So these are really special. And this one made all the more so by an inspired choice of strap color here. Mm -hmm. So I find that these watches tend to look best on different color straps, which is why we switched it to a bright green. You know, one of the other... Um, interesting points of these watches is just how every single dial is different. Like if you were to compare five of the same exact watch next to each other, every single watch would be noticeably different and you would be able to tell each one apart. As you move from metal to metal, you know, yellow gold to white gold to rose gold, as you had mentioned, it's a mother and her son that produce these watches. They have slightly different styles in terms of their clothes and hang. And the, the, the dials themselves, in terms of simply being different, you can see that there's a different style. Um, there's, on the rose gold ones, it's the, the detailing of the continents is less fine. There's a little bit more blurring between the continents and the oceans. It's, it, it's seemingly a little bit more artistic and less exact. And I think that that's just one of the quirks and the specialties of these watches. The movements are gorgeous, by the way. It's one of the few times where a Patek dial really takes pride of place over the caliber itself. Uh, jumping back into the box, bum, bum, bum. Here's a this or that from Hussein Harry saying, hey Tim, new Omega Speedmaster 2021 Sapphire Sandwich or Datejust 41 is a one and only watch. Well, if you ever have to get the watch wet, I'm gonna say go with the Datejust 41 just cause it's a more versatile watch overall. Uh, in terms of power reserve, it's longer. You can put it down for a weekend. It's still beating on Monday. And provided you get one of the loomed variants of the Datejust 41, you get a loomed dial, I think that would be a better choice as a one and only watch unless you have a very strong preference for the Speedmaster. I always say buy the watch that looks best to you on your wrist because that's ultimately what's gonna determine whether you enjoy or move on with that watch. Yeah, I, tend to, I tend to agree. I think that the, the Datejust 41 is one of the most versatile watches in the industry right now. Look, here's a great question from Luftwaffel asking, how do you think the Patek 5130 or 5231, how do you think it compares with the Laurent Ferrier Galet Traveler World Time? They have their own cloisonne enamel dials. How do we compare them overall as watches? Um, I mean, overall as watches, I think that for me, the, the ease of use on this watch takes the cake. I, I've rarely seen a world time that's as straightforward and easy to use as Patek Philippe's. Um, you know, the Laurent Ferry movement is absolutely gorgeous. Um, for me though, just the world time reference as a whole, like I think Patek when I think the world time reference. And as far as the cloisonning of the dial itself in relation to a world time, you know, Patek was the original. So there's other brands that have done it since, but it's, and it's not necessarily done in homage to what Patek has done. It's really done because there's a frame of, there's a frame of reference that consumers over a long period of time have with thinking about this watch. And it's almost created a world time clause in a category uh, for other brands to step into, which of course, you know, Laurent Ferrier does have roots with Patek Philippe. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons why he's since come out with that watch. Um, but the, you know, the, I'd say the artistry of the Laurent Ferrier takes up a, a much greater percentage of the dial. So, you know, if you're, if you're looking at it from that perspective, he also has many different variations, right? Like different color schemes. Uh, you can even customize uh, 
if you want to customize a Laurent Ferrier, uh, you can do that. So there's a little bit more optionality there. But uh, for me, you know, again, I'm, I'm going with the pad of cans down. I think you, f you have to mention first and foremost that there is going to be a big price disparity. When you're talking about these watches used, I would imagine the difference could be forty, fifty thousand mm -hmm. $50,000, like substantial. Uh, so second, I would also say that the Laurent Ferrier, although it looks similar with the cloisonne dial and the travel functions, it is a dual time mm -hmm. explicitly, and this is a world time, and they are different. Um, I would also say that the Laurent Ferrier wears much larger and thicker, but on the flip side, it also has finer movement finish. And part of that is just the fact that this caliber 240 micro rotor in the Patek, it is a heritage movement. It's been around since 1977, and it reflects the architectural and finishing limits of something that Patek tooled up to build a long time ago. Whereas the Laurent Ferry, I want to say it's the LF230. It is a very handsomely decorated movement that sets new standards for the class. The bevels are immense. The interior angles are many. The black polishing is broad. Even the Cote de Genève are a little bit more luminous, light, and wavy. So this is just an outstanding example of a world-time cloisonne enamel. And I don't fault it in any way. I just think that Laurent Ferrier did have the benefit of first benchmarking this watch and then launching its own watch in a similar style. Technically speaking, I think the Laurent has the advantage as the double direct impulse escapement system is more sophisticated, the power reserve is longer, the movement itself is better to look at, but you can't wear them upside down, and ultimately it's going to be the case and the dial that really decide it. And I think on that basis, they are very similar. Price is probably going to be the deciding factor for most. All right. One more watch, and this one is the kicker. Uh, this is an intricate dial, as per today's theme, but only because the pantograph that cut it created 60,000 tiny little bumps on the tapisserie hobnail, and this is an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak 5402 A series. It is the 1,035th Royal Oak ever made. It's Authentic and original Gay Frère bracelet is stamped 172 because it was built in the first quarter of 1972. The dial, navy blue, almost black, galvanized, and cut on a pantograph at Stern, which is the dial constructor associated with the found, well, not the founding, but the owning family of Patek Philippe. So this is a Stern Frère dial cut on a pantograph, a 19th century lathe that mimics a larger template and creates the little hobnail you see right here. The dial is original tritium and in outstanding condition, and it features all of the traits of the original Gerald Genta Royal Oak. Again, the 1035th made, and that's verified by the fact that, well, it's stamped on the case back. You can see it right there. The case back, integral to the case. It's a monoblock case. In the modern era, the Royal Oak Jumbo has gone away from this post-2017. This one has one form of case and case back with everything. The dial, the movements, all loaded through the front in the traditional Royal Oak construction. Only 7.3 millimeters thick, 39 millimeters in diameter. The timepiece is ultra slim and it features the JLC-based caliber 2121 internally. This is as good as it gets. Now, I'll be honest, this is a vintage watch with the compromises that a vintage watch entails. You can't swim with it. You can't shock it to death. It's not anti-magnetic. And the condition of the watch, I would rate as about 75 out of 100, meaning it is a good, solid, daily driver vintage timepiece. Not a museum piece, but a very good example with the strength of this particular unit being the integrity of the bracelet and the cleanliness of the dial. This is a real investment grade watch. In a 2-3 condition, to use the automotive grading scale, these are still investment grade and worth solidly over six figures. So you're not going to find too many of this vintage. If you want to go right back to the beginning, I mean, we're talking the primordial ooze or stainless steel in this case, that's it. A-series Royal Oak 1972, the 5402, and one of only two examples that I've encountered in seven years of doing this. <laughs> All right. I mean, I don't know what else there is to say. That's a hell of a watch. Let's see what you guys are saying in the box right here. Aaron Cohen, you can't beat a truly thin sports watch, truly elegant. We've got Hannes saying, without the Royal Oak AP, probably would not be existing anymore. Possibly true. Geezer saying, hi, Tim. Hi, Geezer. Good to see you in the box right there. And let's see what else. Baltimore Spirits Co. This man is all about his whiskey. He likes that. Second time today he gets to enjoy that AP. It's true, you can see my inventory show earlier today showcasing this watch with a dedicated video soon to come. 
And Bugsy Malone saying, if Patek found a way to produce a higher volume steel sports watch, making clear that it's something separate, but you're buying into an instant classic, they take over the world if priced at 10,000 pounds. Good question here. Is that even possible? If you make a cheaper, more accessible Patek sports watch, doesn't that diminish the appeal by definition? I think so. I think Vacheron did it with the 56, and it, it was a flop. And uh, you know, it was something that we had said to them at the time that we thought that it diminished the brand going with a lower price point. You know, I think that they were trying to capture some of Jaeger's audience. It honestly even looked like a Jaeger or Obama Mercier. Um, not to say that I don't like the watch, because the watch itself, I think, is it's well made. It was well priced. I just, I don't, the watch as a whole was a nice watch. I just don't know that if it was right for Vacheron. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that this would be a move that's just not right for Paddock. I think, could they produce something? Yes. But do I think that it would diminish the brand as a whole? Yes. Do I think that they need to do it? No. You know, you got to be real careful when going down market. And I think a great example of this done well is Elegant by F.P. Journe, where the Elegant Quartz watch, it is, it is by F.P. Journe, but it is not part of the Journe model line formally. They're, they're built in separate quantities. They're not counted towards the 900 or so watches that Journe makes each year. And they're clear that it is a lifestyle watch more than an artisanal watch. And I do think you need that firewall if you're going far down market and price point. Uh, you see it with BMW and Mini. Obviously the same company, but Mini is sold in a separate showroom at a different price point under a different name and so on and so forth. You do need that firewall. A 10,000 pound or 10,000 Swiss franc or 10,000 and Euro uh, Patek Philippe would be hot briefly, but there would be a long-term price to pay in terms of brand equity, especially if the thing ever became common. And you know, you'd be you'd be paying for quartz because they wouldn't be putting you know, they, they don't have the capacity and they wouldn't be putting an automatic movement or manual wind movement into that watch. So you'd be expecting them to put quartz into that watch, and I just don't see buying a, a men's sport Patek Philippe quartz watch. I just don't think it's in line with what the brand represents or, or what they want their customers to have. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think ultimately the best thing Patek can do is redesign the Aquanaut this year and give the model a new lease on life. It's had a really good run since the 5167 arrived in 2007. I think now it's time at a, at a bare minimum to give it the movement from the Nautilus so it has hacking seconds and possibly to redesign the case with a better lug fit across smaller wrists. I think that would be really neat, especially if they find a way to build a little bit more flexibility into the strap. I think there's room for re revision there and they can do things with their existing sports watches without blowing up the entire pricing structure of the brand and going that far down market. All right, one last quick plug, guys. Join me for my Zoom event. Um, I'm going to be there. Brian's going to be there, right? Brandon's going to be there. And all our friends from the Facebook group are going to be present. But you got to be in it to enjoy it. And the link is in the description to register. Thank you so much. Thanks to Brian. Awesome selection. He called the intricate dial theme for today. Thanks to my crew. And thanks to you. Time out, Tim out, Brian out. And thanks for logging on.